welcome to CyberSight. Good morning. My name is Nurse Sandy and I'm from the USA. Today I'm going to talk about some common oculoplastic surgeries we perform in our minor procedure room. The objectives are listed and at the end of this talk you'll be able to identify the anatomic deficit causing the eyelid malposition. You'll be able to describe the surgical techniques to repair it and also discuss the nursing care before and after surgery. For centuries, ophthalmic patients have been troubled with more than just cataracts and glaucoma. Ptosis, lower lid laxity, and even a lacrimal fistula have been a nuisance for patients for as these drawings show. And even in the 21st century, we are still dealing with lumps and bumps eyelid malpositions. The delivery of surgical care has shifted from the acute hospital setting to outpatient facilities and or minor procedure rooms within the doctor's offices. Minor surgical procedures that use only a local anesthetic have proven to be safe and cost effective. Here's a list of the different uh, medical practices using minor surgical procedures. And I just wish to comment on the intravitreal injections in the research I've done uh, for this lecture that in 2016, there were an estimated 6 million intravitreal injections performed in the USA. So using sterile instruments and aseptic technique, the surgeon's hands are scrubbed wearing sterile gloves, sterile drape, the patient's skin is prepped. Uh, we're able to perform minor surgeries and here are two types of minor uh, surgeries being performed. The uh, slide on the right shows surgeons with full drape and sterile gowns. And that's the choice we use when we do blepharoplasties or ptosis. But most other procedures are as the surgeon in the first slide shows. And it's much like going to the dentist. We accept that we walk in, we wear our street clothes into the procedure room, we have a local injection, there's a slight discomfort, but then the procedure is done. There's no IV or anesthesia gases or sedation. Now these two slides are giving you an idea of what our minor procedure room looks like. We have glass cabinets so we can see where our supplies are located. We have a, an electric surgical chair that reclines the patient. And then we often sit them up, particularly during, during a ptosis surgery to evaluate the height of the eyelid and also the symmetry of it with the unoperated eye. And then we recline the patient. We have the overhead surgical lamps and we have a cautery machine. We have mayo stands, a back table when we do a full drape. And you'll notice a red emergency cart that has an oxygen tank, suction, and also an automated um, external defibrillator, as well as emergency medicines, IV supplies, and AMBU bag, because we are healthcare providers and the unexpected can happen. During our minor room procedures, we'll monitor the patients. We have a pulse oximeter and we have an automated blood pressure monitoring machine. And now let's have a look at some of the um, ocular anatomy that we're going to be reviewing today, we're focusing on what's called the ocular adnexa. Those accessory structures um, to the eye, it's not the eye itself. And in particular, we're going to focus on the eyelids and the lacrimal system. The eyelids are movable folds of skin which cover the eye and they function to protect from trauma, to reduce excess light from entering the eye, and to spread the tear film across the cornea. We blink our eyes on the average of four to six times a minute. The palpebral fissure is a vertical and horizontal measurement of the eyelids and the uh, horizontal uh, length is measured from corner to corner, which is the medial canthus is the aspect of our eyelids next to the nose and the lateral canthus is directly opposite. But more importantly is the fissure height, which in the adult is normally 10 to 12 millimeters. It's measured through the pupil from the upper to lower eyelid. As you're looking at this normal eye, 
the white sclera as it uh, is covered with the conjunctiva, which is a mucous membrane that also lines the eyelids. There are goblet cells which secrete a mucus to help with tear lubrication. In the medial canthal area, you see two fleshy mounds of tissue. The plica semilunaris is a folded portion of conjunctiva, and the caruncle is a modified form of canthal tissue, and it has some sweat and oil glands. What I'd like to also point out in this photo is that the upper eyelid is covering perhaps one to two millimeters of the cornea, and the lower eyelid is just touching the limbus. And this tells me that this eyelid is in good position to have an effective blink. And when people are troubled with eyelid lesions or such, they're not going to be able to uh, moisten their eye. The first layer of, um, is, as I mentioned, with skin, we're now looking at the orbicularis oculi muscle, which is the muscle we use to squeeze our eyes shut and to wink. And beneath the orbicularis muscle is the septum, which is a fibrous tissue extending from the orbital rim and forming our eyelids with thickened plates of tissue that we call tarsus. Upon the tarsal plates are these uh, groupings of glands. The gland of Zeiss are for the ciliary follicle or eyelash and secretes a sebaceous oil. The gland of Moll is a modified sweat gland. And the meibomian glands are sebaceous oily glands that secrete a, a substance called mybum that reduces the um, tear film from evaporating as quickly as it might. And the black arrows here are pointing to the openings of the meibomian gland on the tarsal edge. There are orbital fat pads that serve to protect the eye and to uh, be a reserve of energy. And the gentleman has a pooching in his upper orbit that indicates a um, prolapse of his orbital fat because the septum has weakened with age, as all things will, and the septum no longer contains the orbital fat in its pouch. There are tendons and muscles of the eyelids. The medial canthal tendon and lateral canthal tendon help support the eyelids, and the medial canthal tendon is attached to the bone of the maxilla, our facial bone, and the lateral canthal tendon is attached to Wittenall's tubercle a bony prominence on the zygomatic bone of the orbit. There are muscles to help open and close our eyes that we often call retractors, and the levator muscle of the upper eyelid is uh, attached to the upper eyelid tarsal plate, and a, a, a fibrous tissue formation from the inferior rectus is the capsulopalpebra fascia. Now, a closer look at all this muscle structure, the levator has a more formal name, levator palpebri superioris. And as it comes out from the orbit onto the tarsal plate, it changes from a skeletal muscle to a pearly white fibrous tissue that is called aponeurosis. And that's what is attaching the levator muscle to the eyelid. Next to the aponeurosis, is a smooth muscle that contributes about one to two millimeters of eyelid elevation, and that is called Mueller's muscle. The, over, the lower eyelid retractor, as I said, is a fibrous piece of tissue from the inferior rectus, and its true job is just to help hold the lower eyelid erect. The lacrimal system has a lacrimal gland in the superior temporal orbit area and has ducts that open onto the eye. We blink and the tear moves over to the lacrimal drainage system. In the medial aspect of your um, upper and lower eyelids, there are two drains, punctum, and they have their pipings into the common canaliculus and into the lacrimal sac and eventually into our nose. So here's a question that will give you a few seconds to respond to, and that is included in the ocular adnexa are all but one of the following, lacrimal apparatus, 
glands of Mall, Zeiss, and Meibomian, retina, or tarsal plate of eyelids. So please let us know which answer is the one you like and incorrect. All righty, 100%. We have a really smart crew on board. Thank you for responding. So let's get started with having our first patient. We're always going to do a complete eye exam on our patient to be sure there's no other ocular problems. We want to know their medical history, medicines they're taking, and if they are allergic to anything, and proceed to evaluate and determine what their eye problem is from an oculoplastic standpoint. And so this young lady has come to us with a chalazion. In some parts of the world, I've heard chalazion. You hear tomatoes, tomato. It's all correct. And it's a constipated meibomian gland. And she's had it about two weeks. It's painless, but it's annoying. She did use the warm compresses, but it didn't resolve her problem. And so we're going to schedule her for an incision and drainage of the chalazion. Our minor surgery instructions are in this format to check with the patient and confirm that they are not taking any blood thinners. Otherwise, we will need for them to stop that. We want them to not use aspirin, ibuprofen, Alka-Seltzer, Ecotrin, um, Bufferin for two weeks before surgery. And that also includes the supplement vitamin E or alcohol for two weeks. Vitamin E and alcohol also make your platelets less sticky. We do want them to take their routine meds on the day of surgery and to have a light meal and drink. We don't want them wearing makeup and or fingernail polish and to wear comfortable clothing and they must have someone to drive them home. Well, this young lady doesn't take any medicines except birth control. She has no allergies and she has agreed to only use Tylenol if she has an ache or a pain. The day of surgery's arrived and this is Nurse Keenan. He's from Kenya. He's working on the Flying Eye Hospital as I speak and he has the thumbs up because she has eaten the light meal. She did take her birth control. She has someone to drive her home. Blood thinners are not a part of her lifestyle. She did go to the restroom beforehand. Her consent is signed and the operative eye is marked. Her vital signs are stable and we are completing the surgical safety checklist. As you can see, these patients are wearing their street clothes. They're in the minor procedure room. They just have a surgical hat on to keep their hair out of the way. We have our masks on, we've opened up the instruments. And these are just uh, some of the instruments that we'll use for an incision and drainage of a chalazion. Westcott's 0.3 forceps, a chalazion uh, curette, often called, we call it a spoon, a chalazion clamp, a Bard Parker blade handle, a number 30 gauge needle, and a bottle of xylocaine 2%. The color is blue and it indicates there's no additives in that. So I know that it's just plain lidocaine, xylocaine. I wanted you to see a bottle of lidocaine 2% with epinephrine, one to 100,000 dilution. My surgeons prefer to use this mixture because of the vasoconstrictive properties of epinephrine. We're cutting tissue and it helps to minimize the bleeding you will find what your surgeons prefer to use and that's what you'll use. We'll also have a number 11 blade and cautery Q-tips and some four by fours. So we're injecting the local anesthetic into the patient's eyelid. And while this happens, we have them hold our hand so that we can count down to when they don't feel any discomfort. The surgeon is also gently talking to them and I go into kind of a, um, a trance talk in terms of 10, 9, 8. You're doing great. That's great. Just think the medicine is getting absorbed into your tissue. You're doing wonderfully. 7, 6. And usually by the time we reach 1, the medication has taken effect. I begin, I 
can feel my hand again because their grip has relaxed and we proceed with surgery. Sometimes I have to count a little longer because patients might need a little more medication, but it's very effective to hold their hands. And so we apply the Shalazion clamp and we flip the eyelid so that we can work from the conjunctival side. And that is the chicken fat or the mybum that is kind of congealed and the uh, gland could not excrete it. And we remove it with our Shalazion spoon and then we'll maybe do a little cautery, we'll apply a steroid antibiotic ointment, we'll pressure patch the eye and ask them to remove that in six hours or before going to bed. We'll ask them to use the ointment three times a day for a week and then we'll see them back in two weeks. And we always call our patients to see how they're doing day one post-op. How are you feeling? Is the pain manageable? Uh, swelling, any issues with bleeding, or any other questions they might have. For many people, they're saying, you know, I, I didn't want to call, but you've just lifted a burden off their shoulder. And sometimes we have to call them a second day or a few days later. And if we need for them to talk with the doctor, we will. Here's another question. The levator aponeurosis attaches to the upper eyelid at Wittenall's tubercle, Lockwood's lig ligament, or the tarsal plate? Got about 15 seconds to give a reply, please. <clears throat> All righty, gold star for everybody. Tarsal plate is the correct answer. Well, let's have a look at this problem called ptosis, which is drooping of the upper eyelid. And in this older gentleman, we can see that that left eye, that palpebral fissure, is much smaller than the normal 10 to 12 millimeters. And the black arrows in the picture on your right are showing the white aponeurosis, and it's detached. It's not where it needs to be to hold the eyelid in proper place. So acquired aponeurotic ptosis is the most common form of ptosis, whether it's stretching or dehiscence of the aponeurosis. Frequently, patients who have, uh, they rub their eyes a lot, or if they are contact lens wearers, the hard contact lens, where they have to pull on the upper eyelid to help push the contact lens out of their eye, that can contribute to the aponeurosis weakening its hold. And also, a lot of times patients will notice after they've had intraocular surgery, uh, particularly cataracts, now they can see better and they go, wow, that eyelid is really droopy. I want to have it fixed. So they come in for their complete eye examination. And we'll be reviewing a young lady, or rather an older lady who's had, who has ptosis. And she does take a baby aspirin, 81 milligrams. Well, we do need for her to check with her doctor about stopping that. We need the prescribing doctor to recommend that she can stop the aspirin because we don't want to compromise her health. And we instruct her about aspirin and ibuprofen, Ecotrin, the vitamin E, she doesn't drink alcohol, and all the rest of the items listed here. We will tentatively book her appointment, but we need for her to confirm that she can stop the baby aspirin. Well, Keenan's got his thumbs up, and she did call us back to confirm she could be off the baby aspirin for a week. And so schedule of surgery is going to happen. She has a driver, and we've confirmed there have been no other medicines that could thin her blood. The consent is signed. It's a unilateral procedure, so we are marking the eye. Her vital signs are stable, and we are completing our surgical safety checklist. The local anesthetic is injected along the marked skin crease, and the instruments you're looking at include, oh, a number 15 blade on that Bard Parker blade handle, a rake, a bipolar uh, cautery tip, needle holder, Damar retractor, and a few more forceps and Q-tips. The skin is incised, and your second picture is showing you the septum being open to the levator aponeurosis. 
the skin and obicularis are retracted in the forceps, and the first needle is pointing to the yellow fat pad, and beneath it, the lower needle is pointing to the pearly white aponeurosis. The slide on your right is showing you how that levator aponeurosis needs to be drugged back down onto the tarsal plate. We have placed some 5-0 vicral sutures and they're temporary ties because at this point we want to sit the patient up to view how the eyelid height is, the contour, before we place the suture in a permanent tie. We're satisfied so we recline the patient, we finish our suturing, we close the orbicularis with absorbable suture and then close the skin with a 6-0 nylon. And after surgery, we have our patients recline in a chair with cold compresses, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off for the next 48 to 72 hours. This is to minimize the swelling and also it's comforting. It feels good. We um, teach them how to use four by four gauze, get them wet, wring them out, and then place them in the freezer where they can get really icy cold. And they make a very good and light cold compress. You can also do it with um, a cloth, washcloth. Some people really like using frozen peas. So whatever works for them. We'll ask them to use antibiotic ointment to the incision uh, suture sites three times a day for a week and come back for suture removal. We'll go ahead and give them some Tylenol because it is normal to have some discomfort and a prescription for Percocet should they need something stronger. We ask them to not continue, to not use ibuprofen, but this young lady is going to resume her aspirin, 81 milligrams, per the instructions from her doctor. And whenever patients do have to stop a medication, we check with our uh, surgeon when uh, they report back that they can be off it for X amount of days to confirm that that is satisfactory for us to deal with in the minor procedure room. And should the patient continue to have discomfort in spite of using Percocet, then we'll um, need for them, want them to call the office so we can determine what's going on. We continue with that post-op day uh, number one phone call to see how are you doing? Is the pain manageable? How's the swelling? Sometimes there's lower lid swelling and that's just due to the lymphatic drainage system. And so there may be some puffiness there, which is normal. But if there are any questions that we can't answer, we'll have the doctor speak with them directly. The next problem we're going to look at is called ectropion, and that is laxity in the horizontal dimension of the eyelids. It can be the medial canthal and or the lateral canthal tendons. Now, as you look at this gentleman's lower eyelid, there is no way all that sclera showing that his eyeballs can be comfortable. That lower eyelid bilaterally is not touching the limbal space. And so when you just look at someone, you can begin to tell what their problem might be. And in the case of this gentleman, anatomically, the picture I'm showing of the laxity of a lateral canthal tendon, his procedure is to tighten the lateral canthal tendon. We've completed our eye examination. This is a patient who takes a blood pressure medicine and something for his cholesterol. So that's fine, just continue to take those medicines. Please, no aspirin, ibuprofen or Ecotrin, et cetera. Oh, this gentleman likes a cocktail every evening, so we've asked him to stop that, and we are going to schedule him two weeks out from having uh, stopped his alcohol intake. He can have someone drive him, he'll wear comfortable clothing, et cetera. The day of surgery, the patient has not had a drink for the two weeks. He's taken his usual meds. His vital signs are stable. He's been to the restroom. The uh, procedure is bilateral, so we don't need to mark the eye. And he has signed a consent, and we're completing the surgical safety checklist. So after injection of local anesthetic, we perform a lateral canthotomy so that we can view the orbital rim, and then we cut the lateral canthal tendon. This frees up the lower eyelid because we need to split it 
to open up an anterior and posterior lamella so that we can get to the tarsal plate and fashion a strip, a new canthal tendon from the tarsus. And you see in uh, portion D of this slide that tarsal strip being pulled towards the periosteum and attached. We'll use a 4-0 vicral suture and then close the skin with a 6-0 nylon and having cut away the excess skin. And here's what someone can look like after they've had bilateral lateral tarsal strips. Again, look to see where the lower eyelid is touching at the limbus, and that just tells you that this eye is in a much better place than what his before surgery picture shows. Again, we call the patient, see how they're doing, any questions, any issues. If we do need to see them, we ask them to come in right away. So here's a new question. A lateral tarsal strip surgery is used to correct punctal stenosis, obstructed meibomian gland, or a lateral canthal tendon laxity, or esotropia? Have a few seconds to answer that, please. <clears throat> All righty, gold stars for everyone. Let's look at another problem of a lower eyelid. And again, I'm first looking at this patient and I see that the lower eyelid is not touching the limbus. So something's wrong there, whether it's lax. Uh, you can even see in his case, these eyelashes are rolled up against the conjunctiva and perhaps even rubbing onto the cornea, which gives a foreign body sensation, causes tearing. And in this case, the problem with entropion is that the oftentimes the, and the entire eyelid has a rotation towards the globe, indicates to me that the capsulopalpebral fascia has lost its positioning to the lower um, eyelid tarsus, and we need to reattach it. In this gentleman's case, there's also lower lid laxity, so he's going to have two procedures combined in one surgery. Now, this gentleman, uh, does not take Coumadin, but he's diabetic and he uses insulin. That's not a problem. Please take that as you normally would, your usual dose. Please eat lightly. Um, that's not a restriction. He does not use any ibuprofen or aspirin. He only likes Tylenol for discomfort. He does not drink or use vitamin E. And so he can complete the checklist here and it's written down for them to take with them as well. And on the day of surgery, Keenan has his thumbs up. We're doing good. He's had a light meal. He did have his insulin this morning. No blood thinners. The eye is consented and the eye is rather the eye is marked and the consent is signed. The vital signs are stable and we've completed our surgical safety checklist. So we've also we've called the eyelid uh, muscles that raise and lower the eye in the upper eyelid and in the lower eyelid retractors because they have specific duties in holding the eyelids in place and to raise and lower them. So the capsulopalpebra fascia is what we're going to go get and reattach. We use, um, we've done our injection and made our skin incision and we're showing the uh, retractors in the forceps. This is a better view of forceps holding the retractors that we're going to reattach to the tarsal plate to correct that rotation of the lower eyelid into the eye. We'll use a 6-0 fast absorbable suture. We place about six to eight of them. And then we're going to continue with the lateral tarsal strip that this patient also needs. So sometimes surgeries need to be combined to repair the malposition they're having. A 6-0 fast absorbing suture was used to close and we like to do our incision just under the eyelashes because that camouflages the incision line and you can see how nicely it's healing up a week later and look at that nice position and tightness of the lower eyelid and certainly it's touching the corneal limbus. It looks still a little swollen and that should come down. 
but that eye looks a lot more comfortable. Phone call the next day to see how things are, any questions, and life is good. Epiphora, excessive watering. So why is the eye doing that? Is it because the lacrimal gland is on hyper mode operating? Or is there some obstruction in the drainage system? And in the case of this patient, we're looking at stenosis, maybe scarring of her punctum. In the first picture, you can barely see any type of punctum. And in the screen on the right, you can see how the um, mouth of the uh, punctum is swollen, um, irregular almost. It, it makes it difficult for the tear to enter into there. It can be due to repeated probings, um, use of glaucoma medications such as Eserine, for example, um, infections such as herpes zoster. And in short, the punctum can't take the fluid in the tear. We've done our complete eye exam. This patient is perfectly healthy. Um, she doesn't take any blood thinners. She does take metoprolol for blood pressure. That's fine. Take that on the day of surgery as you normally would. She only uses Tylenol. She doesn't drink nor take any vitamin E. She satisfies and understands all the questions here and instructions of what to do, what not to do. The day of surgery, well, Keenan's got his thumbs up. She's eaten a light meal. She ta she's taken her blood pressure medicine, metoprolol, and she's got a good blood pressure. Someone is there to drive her home. She is consented and the operative eye is marked. And we've completed our surgical safety checklist. The three snip punctoplasty is performed after we've injected our local anesthetic. And remember, hold your patient's hand. It is so comforting and really does build some trust and confidence that they're glad they are where they are. Uh, the three snip punctoplasty is a rectangular or triangular cutting into the punctum. And you can see how it is um, two vertical cuts with a horizontal and the triangular cut um, is more invasive into the um, horizontal canaliculus of a punctum. Either way, we're trying to open uh, the punctum to allow more tears to enter. And to minimize um, secondary closure with healing or scar tissue developing, we're going to place a silicone stent and we're going to use a pigtail probe. And we use the probe to insert gently through the upper punctum and rotate out of the lower punctum. It has an eyelet that we thread a 5-0 proline suture and then rotate it back. So now we have the suture coming through both openings of the punctum. Actually, puncta is plural. At that point, we're going to trim the proline suture, excuse me, we're going to take the silicone stent it's roughly 25 millimeters and apply a small amount of antibiotic ointment and we're going to rotate that through the upper punctum along the proline suture to be in place that it totally encircles the canalicular tract of the two punctums and um, bring that um, silastic tubing together, tie the proline into a knot, trim the excess uh, silicone stent and cover it so that it comes together enough to close over the proline knot. We then rotate that about 180 degrees into the common canalicular area, and it remains there for about eight to 12 weeks. The patient's own tears will pass over the tubing, and they will come back and have the uh, silicone stent and proline suture removed. We untie the knot, at the slit lamp and then we um, pull the tubing and the proline out. And hopefully that will complete uh, her problems with epiphora permanently. Again, we're going to call them the day after to see how they're doing, are there any questions, and deal with what is happening for our patient. Here's the final question. 
Patients with excessive tearing and blurry vision may have a cataract, entropion, punctal stenosis, or entropion and punctal stenosis. 15 seconds. Let us know what you think. <clears throat> All righty, gold stars for everyone. It is punctal stenosis and entropion. A cataract is really not going to cause you to have tearing and blurry vision. I say yes to the blurry vision, but it's not going to have the tearing. That's the real clue right here. Thank you so much. So finally, we're going to look at a unilateral facial paralysis called Bell's palsy. It affects the seventh cranial nerve. We don't know why it happens. We, we blame things on viral infections. Sometimes this is associated with herpes or viral meningitis, but it can be traumatic, like a skull fracture. And in the case of Sylvester Stallone, when his mom was giving birth, they had to use forceps to help him be born, and those forceps damaged the left side of his face, giving him the paralysis and the features that he has and the manner in which he speaks. So an inability to close the eyelid is also called lag ophthalmus. There's drooping of the mouth, there can be drooling, there can be ear pain and jaw pain because the seventh cranial nerve serves those organs as well. And it can just come on out of nowhere. Um, it can last three to six months. It can be very transient or it can be permanent. Here's another actor with Bell's palsy. And I did try to find a good picture of Angelina Jolie with her episode of Bell's palsy, but there aren't any. And so for some patients, the placement of a gold weight is an option to help completely close their eye. These patients are very tired of having to use the artificial tears and ocular lubricants as frequently as they have to. And so if the option of a gold weight is viable for them, we go for it. Um, one drawback with a gold weight is that um, the patient has to be aware that they may have a totic eyelid after the gold weight is placed. But for many, that's not the problem that they've been living with in terms of lag ophthalmus and the ocular discomfort of an exposed cornea and eye. Gold weights come in a variety of sizes, uh, 0 0.6 to 1.6 grams. They have a curvature to fit the tarsal plate, and they have three holes that allow for the suturing to attach them to the tarsal plate. Um, gold and platinum can be used. They are both inert metals and well tolerated by the body. And this side view just shows how we're going to place it beneath the orbicularis muscle to the tarsal plate. We'll make a pocket. And this young man has had his gold weight um, three months and doing well with his eye closure. However, first, our patients are going to have their complete eye exam. We're going to make sure there's no other ocular reason or medical history of sorts that needs to be treated first. And then we've scheduling them for surgery. We have done a trial wearing of the gold weight to determine which one will be the best fit for them. Um, we are completing our minor surgery instructions. This patient does not take a blood thinner. She um, does not use aspirin or any of these other products. She uh, does drink wine, so we're going to have to wait two weeks before we schedule her for surgery, and she's willing to do that. Um, she does not take any vitamin E. And we complete the rest of the instruction sheet here, and two weeks away, surgery is scheduled. She has stayed away from her wine. She's looking forward to it later today. And she has someone to drive her home. Keenan has a thumbs up. She's been to the restroom. She's only used Tylenol. The eye is marked. The consent is signed. Her vital signs are stable. And we've completed our surgical safety checklist. We've marked the eyelid crease 
uh, but we've only we're only going to open a small section because we only need a small pocket to fill uh, with the gold weight and the lidocaine has been injected and you can see the gold weight getting ready to be inserted and here it is now tied into the pocket with 70 nylon suture we'll then close the obicularis and then the skin the patient will use an antibiotic ointment for the next week we like for them to use a cool compress immediately afterwards because we want to minimize swelling and will aid in discomfort and here are some patients post gold weight placement who have their before pictures and afterwards you see nice closure you also really don't uh, notice that they have a bulge or that they're wearing something on their upper eyelid and certainly this gentleman look at the amount of lag ophthalmist there that poor left eye is miserable and um, I know that they had a lot of relief from their surgeries so if the Bell's palsy resolves and we just remove the um, gold weight and they now have a new piece of jewelry we'll make our post procedure phone call see what problems they're having and if um, they need to come in we're certainly going to have them do that well there you have it common oculoplastic procedures performed in the minor OR I hope this information will enhance your nursing care and take your skills to another level of expertise. And do remember to hold the patient's hand while the local injection is given. It will comfort and reassure them more than you know. I'll be happy to answer any questions and thanks for stopping by. Thank you, Nurse Sandy. Um, if you wanna go ahead and stop sharing your screen, we've got one Q&A question so far. How do I find stopping my stop share? Yep. Okay. So if you can open the Q&A box, which is right next to share screen. Yes. So there's one question so far. Can you see that? Yes, I do. So Perfect. I can talk and answer? Yep, just like that. Okay. Let's move this here. Uh, how much lidocaine is enough? Well, your surgeon has going to have that expertise of when they're training and they'll know how much we generally use a 3 cc syringe but we don't necessarily have to inject the whole 3 cc or 3 mls it also depends on your patient and the type of surgery that you're doing um all the procedures where we don't need a lot but until we have a or where they're not sensating we're not going to start cutting so when the patient does not feel the needle touching their skin pointed edge in to see if they feel that you're going to continue to give medication and your surgeon will decide when enough is enough thank you so that seems like the only live question um, we had some questions asked at the time of registration and since we have about 10 to 15 minutes do you mind just maybe going through these Sure. Can I move this box out of here? Yep. Okay. Alrighty. There were some questions uh, posted when y'all registered, and I'm looking at one that says, I am setting up an oculoplastics nurse led clinic and wonder if you have any advice. Um, my comments would be no, your facility, depending if you're hospital or a private office, what are the regulations that your country or um, uh, medical institute or regulatory boards of your government require you to be licensed as a physician's office? Um, I would certainly look to uh, the AORN guidelines um, and look at other facilities that have already been set up because why work so hard when somebody else has already gone down this path? You need to just network with people to know what they did and be sure those are the present uh, guidelines in your particular country. Um, next question here. I would like to know all the steps one by one to all the surgeries and what we need to prepare for all of the surgeries. Well, I think I've given you some ideas for minor surgery procedures certainly for oculoplastics 
the docs like 0 0.3 forceps, a needle holder, Westcott scissors, Steven scissors, uh, a blade handle, uh, rakes, double prong skin hooks. And uh, that's about as far as I can go with that. But please look online to see samples of things because you can build what you what you discover as well as what the preference are for your doctors and the resources that you have available. Um, I'm going to skip number four. And I would like to go to which of the country can I get an offer for oculoplastic nursing and management? Anywhere you want. You just have to go out there and look and offer yourself up. Good luck. Which stent do you prefer for drainage issues? Um, I have no real preference. Again, it's our surgeons. Uh, we're using Crawford silicone stents. Uh, Minoka also makes products. So again, what you can get that's affordable uh, and your surgeons like to use, that will be the preference. And I'm not really understanding the glaucoma question and I'm, uh, that wasn't a topic we covered today. So I'd like to leave that. Uh, reference book, um, yes, there are some good ophthalmic reference books and CyberSight has one of the ophthalmic uh, practices for uh, nursing in, or perioperative theater in lower resource countries. Um, am I answering this live here, Lawrence? Uh, I'll take care of that. Okay. And the next question I'm, um, oh good, thank you, because I can't answer that. And here's a question about when do you use medial conjunctivoplasty? Well, whenever your surgeon feels like that's the correction that the patient needs. I'm not as fluent in that particular procedure, um, but that would be up to the surgeon. They know and have been trained to correct the patient's problem as oculoplastic surgeons. Uh, so you have to trust what they're dictating and wish to do on a patient and help the patient to understand how this procedure will correct and go from there. Great, thank you, Nurse Sandy. So maybe we'll give like 30 seconds to a minute if there's okay. any final questions. Um, Absolutely, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> All right, so I think that's it for today. Um, thank you again, Nurse Sandy. And thank you, Lawrence. Yep, thank you to everyone who joined. Right. Have a good day. All righty, y'all too. Bye bye. Bye.